to welcome to uh, my second, you don't want to see me, you don't want to see my shadow, you don't want to see Christ, my second edition of uh, Inquiry into Orthodoxy, but uh, for a couple uh, uh, little bits of history here, uh, for those who may not have read the, um, the announcement or didn't know exactly what that meant, Father John T. Tavlaridis was the dean of this cathedral for, I believe, 55 years. And he was assigned as an assistant priest for one or two more years after that. So nearly 60 years, he was assigned to this church. Uh, a long and fruitful ministry. This, this gives really good stability to a parish. It really, it really makes you learn what the meaning of father is. I mean, you call a priest father. Sometimes people think that's a title. It's a relational um, exclamation. Right? My father doesn't, uh, my, my daughter doesn't call me dad, baba, really, because she, she only really speaks Greek um, when she speaks English with a Greek accent. Uh, she doesn't call me baba because that's my title. I somehow like got certified a baba. It's because I'm her father. She calls me that. It's, it's a term of relationship. And so Father John was a father, a spiritual father to this community for nearly 60 years and for uh, somewhere between 45 and 47, even Father Steve wasn't sure what the number was. Somewhere, so I, I wrote nearly half a century, nearly 50 years, Father John gave um, his version of this class. And at the, at the beginning, it started off being um, geared towards the spouses of Greek Orthodox people, the spouses who had not converted and were like, well, what have I married myself into, you know? Because in the, in the 50s and 60s, where, you got to remember this is a much different time than we have now. Some of you who are interested in the faith already um, or are in that same position, right? You are, you are you gonna, you're engaged or you have married someone who's in the, in the Orthodox faith. You could go to Google and type in, what does the Greek Orthodox Church believe? And honestly, you might get a pretty good summary of some, some high-level points to get you started. And then you can start your journey of reading. Um, which we'll get back to reading in a minute. That's not primary in the Orthodox faith. But at the time of Father John, this was just not possible. I mean, there are some of us in this room who remember a time where the Internet did not exist. Who, who remembers? Well, and that, let me not do that. I don't want to uh, uh, dox anyone for being too old. I remember. I remember, right? I'll, I'll dox myself. I'm not quite that as young as I, as I look. Um, and I remember the first computer that we got was this huge thing. It was like... <laughs> like four by four or five by five by five box, and it was enormous. Now, now this thing is like 100,000 times more powerful than the computer that sent man to the moon, okay? And man went to the moon in what year? 1969. So Father John was teaching inquiry to orthodoxy before that, before man went to the moon. So people didn't know, right? And they knew that they loved the person that they were with. They knew that this is a Christian church, or they kind of you know, kind of new because it's very different from a lot of the Christianity that we're exposed to in the United States. Um, so it was a lot for that, and it was for some people who, through whatever other means, were interested in the Orthodox faith. Um, these people, uh, sadly, uh, a lot of the kind of one-on-one -on -one or small group education formation, the catechisms that we do, Father John had to do in his house because, you know, we know this about ourselves, the Greek Orthodox. It's not like airing dirty laundry that hasn't already been aired. We had been exclusionary for a long time. We didn't want non-Greek people in the church. And so Father John was a man of great love and uh, great commitment to the flock. And he wasn't going to turn away somebody just because they weren't Greek. He was one of the first priests to um, start using English in the Divine Liturgy. So it was very much not just inwardly focused like like the church is a museum right but outwardly focused the apostolic mission like we were talking about today the first sunday of luke the gospel reading is about becoming fishers of men so that's um well that's that's the why are we here right but the we, he had also the benefit of a surrounding milieu a surrounding culture that was mostly Christian. People knew who Adam and Eve were. People kind of like moved in Christian ways. They thought in Christian ways, more or less, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, now, 70 years later, 
I don't know that we can say that that's the case anymore. Uh, even those of us who are coming from uh, other Christian backgrounds are surrounded by uh, a lack of understanding of basic tenets of the Christian faith. And what is man here on earth to do? Why do we exist? So that's where we're, where we're going to start. A couple ground rules for us. If you have not put your cell phones on silent, I'm going to make sure mine's, on, mine's not on silent. Put your cell phone on silent. We can ask clarifying questions at any time. This is a divergence from Father John's formula. He just straight lectured for, uh, I think, about an hour, and there was a minute, uh, there was a break, and then you lectured for another hour. No questions, ever. <laughs> you may ask clarifying questions at any time, but I ask that you keep your discussion questions for the section at the end, because we're, well, the way we're going to be structured is about 40 minutes worth of lecture. Uh, I've already chewed up six minutes with my silly soliloquy, um, but and then 20 minutes of discussion. They, some of you have already went through with me in the past. The last time I did five two-hour sessions, and they were like about an hour lecture or 45, 55 minutes break, lecture, and then discussion, and it was intense. It was a lot, right? So not that this is not a lot after we've prayed for three and a half hours to do another hour of you know classroom-type education, but uh, as we will delve deeper into in later lectures, in later sessions, the prayer is primary, right? So now that we have prayed together, we are primed actually to learn well. And there's not much that we don't we don't need to like try to learn too much. So two hours was I was trying to match it to the length of Great Lent, but experientially it was a little tough. So that's how we're going to structure our sessions. Uh, oh, and before we get to that. Um, this is not like a necessarily a hard stop, although some days I will have pastoral appointments past the time, and I'll have to um, stop and say, listen, we got to stop right at one hour. Um, but that's when everybody will be dismissed. If there are other questions or in private or whatever, I certainly can hear questions afterward. Um, for those of you who are already enrolled in catechism, uh, this will be the basically... Um, not a replacement, but catechisms will not be reintroducing any new material, really. It will just be a question and answer session. So um, anyone who's not enrolled in catechism, uh, this is fundamentally the, the path through which a non-Orthodox person becomes an Orthodox Christian. Right? But the catechism classes here at St. Sophia made the intentional decision to have them open to everybody because who doesn't, who doesn't want their questions about their faith answered? Right? So if you have uh, more questions uh, or we don't get to your question um, in the 20 minutes of the discussion today, then by all means come on Wednesdays. Like I said, every second and fourth Wednesday, I believe it is, if I've done my math correctly. Come so that we can discuss your questions because that's just an, it's going to be an hour of just people's questions. Right? So we're going to have a very awkward hour if nobody has any questions at Catechism. Maybe it'll be an hour full of me asking you questions, and you don't want that. <laughs> Maybe you do, I don't know. So, um, like we said, Father John started a particular point in, in his introduction, and uh, because of the way that our society has evolved over the past 70 years, I'm going to start basically much earlier, but also in a, in a certain way, much closer to home. Very awkward hour, so and nobody has any questions. What is it, and there will be some audience no. participation, discussion here, which also was not Father John's uh, uh, preference. What do we desire? Con. Some sort of fulfillment. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? What, what do you desire? Stephanie. Happiness. Okay. Yeah. Again, Stephanie, you had another one? Sure, yeah, go ahead. No, no? Money, no, well listen, so money is one of these proxy things. Some people just desire money for its own end, but really 
anyone who, who really thinks about it, they desire money for some other reason, right? Money is a uh, force multiplier. So some people want money because they want to, they say, donate more to charity. Or they want money because they want fast cars. Or they want money because it's power, right? Some people just desire power in another sense, right? Not necessarily monetary purchasing economic power, but political power. So what are the, so, some of the other things that humans desire? A, wor a, sorry, a working phone. <laughs> Someone said shelter? Who? Food, water, shelter. Well, that, these are kind of more needs, but certainly we do desire them. Yeah, that goes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Love. Okay. Anybody other than these three people want to say, what do you desire? No, there's no, there's no real wrong answer here, by the way. I'm not looking for a right answer. It's to connection. What's that? Community. Yeah. Some people desire success or knowledge. Now, here's where the right answer is, right? What do all those things have in common? When a, person, when a human being reaches for something, has a desire for something, you desire something It is outside of you, yeah. But if you say, for example, and this is this is most most apparent in interpersonal relationships, right? If you're looking for a romantic partner, are you going to fall in love with somebody who you don't think is beautiful in some way or another? All right. So, the core of all of these desires is the desire of the human being. The irresistible attraction of beauty. Beauty. Right? It is a beautiful thing to be able to help people in need. And so from that, which is at the core, it, certainly it can get corrupted, but the person desires some sort of power, whether it is economic or political or whatever, is has that desire in them because it is a beautiful thing to help other people. It is a beautiful thing to have Love in your life, connection, community. It is a beautiful thing to be clothed and have food and water because this makes you be able to function as a human being. Now, beauty is all around us, right? So if you go out and you hike to the top of a mountain, most of the time you're out in nature, you're not going to sit there and be like, man, this is so ugly. I don't know that I've ever had that experience when I went out in nature, nature, and I said, this is so ugly. I had that experience, I went to the Great Wall of China, and I saw, I saw Beijing from the Great Wall of China, and there's a cloud of smog over it, and I was like, that's ugly. But nature is ugly. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. The created world is beautiful. And that is a reflection of the fact that the ultimate beauty is Christ. It's the Lord, God, who created us. I think this says it the best. St. Augustine, who is actually often maligned in, uh, in Orthodox circles as someone who, what he said, was easily misinterpreted by the later Western Church to create all sorts of what we consider false doctrines like predestination and things of this, this nature. We'll get to all that in due time. Uh, but in his confessions, his last book, not only did he retract a lot of these erroneous things, but the very first paragraph, he writes, You made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So this is what we're here for, or this is why we've been made, or I guess how we've been made, why uh, God only knows. I don't mean that in a cute way. But God, out of love, created the human, not out of, an, uh, out of a ne necessitating overabundance of love like you might hear from some Roman Catholic theologians. God is not forced to do anything. We can't force God to do anything, and God's not forced by the laws of nature that he himself created to do anything. 
He's in control. God's in control. Novel concept. He created us this way. He created us so that when we find the ultimate beauty in God, we rest. And until that point, we try to find him. We're restless. We're restless until we find our rest in him. So all of the nuggets of beauty that we desire as humans, connection, uh, a good meal, you know, uh, a family, the ability to help others, all of these are ways of knowing the true God. Ways of knowing the true God. But they're not the end in and of themselves. Even if they're good things, right? I'm blocking out St. Augustine over here. Uh, even if they're good things, they're not the end in and of themselves. God is the end of the human being. The end, not, not, not mean like, I'm going to be the end of you. Me, in, in a Greek philosophical sense, the end is the final kind of destination or what that being is always trying to go towards. Even if they take detours around the way. Mistakes, sins. By the way, uh, St. Augustine, feast day, June 15th. We celebrate him as a saint in the Orthodox Church. And St. Dionysius the Areopagite, Dionysius, oh, we are, I can't even see, there we go. Dionysius the Areopagite is mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. He's called the Areopagite because he is on the Adios Pavos, Mars Hill in Athens, where St. Paul preached the gospel to the Athenians. Uh, and um, he's mentioned by name, right? Among these were Dionysius. So this is the initial the Areopagite. He eventually became the Bishop of Athens, uh, and he wrote a treatise called On the Divine Names, in which he kind of expounds on uh, all the different ways in which we find God beautiful, or the ways in which we address him as beautiful. The names then common to the whole deity are the super good, the super essential, the beautiful, the being, the super essential beautiful is called beauty on account of the beauty communicated from itself to all beautiful things in a manner appropriate to each and as cause of the good harmony and brightness of all things. So all, as we say, you were uh, most, if not all of you present for Divine Liturgy today, you heard in this prayer at the end, all good and perfect gifts come from you, the Father of lights. So in everything that we receive, or everything created that is beautiful or that was beautiful and then was ruined by somebody else is beautiful in its own way and because it has as its source of beauty, beauty it's creator. And we have this, this kind of like weird, clunky philosophical language, super essential beautiful. Right? Or the super essential, he is the super essential the being. Super essential means beyond any kind of created nature. So what he is expressing to us is that God's beauty is so transcendent that and infinite that we can never apprehend it. But he gives us signs through which that we can try to ascend to knowing him. So this is, I would say, I would submit, the purpose of our lives. Why are we here as Orthodox Christians? The answer is to have union with God. To enjoy the beautiful for all eternity. And not just eternity, but in this life. So what happened? Why are we not, well, I don't know, maybe you all are all enjoying the divine presence cognitively and you're all elated in bliss and you're like, I don't need to be here. If so, you can probably leave. You're not going to start learning, learn anything from me. But why are we not glowing with divine grace and constantly conscious at an ever-increasing infinite level 
of God's love and his, his beauty and how much he is a father to us. Why is that? Not a rhetorical question. Anybody know? Sin, what? Genesis chapter 3, yeah. You didn't, you've done this already. So, so, yes, so the sin, and in particular, what is termed in the West the original sin, we don't really prefer to call it that. Um, we would rather call it, you know, here in Orthodox kind of writings or, or speaking, ancestral sin. The precise word is the sin of the forefathers. So whereas, again, Augustine was taken uh, and twisted a little bit with some of the things he wrote, uh, so that original sin became something that was hereditarily passed down through humans, through the practice of sex, okay, through generation. Um, we do not believe that we inherit the guilt of the original sin, but rather that we do inherit its effects, because the effects were not localized just to Adam and Eve, but rather, they, because man is connected to everything, man is the crown of creation, everything is connected to him, and so everything else also fell at the fall of Adam and Eve. So let me back up just a second. What was the original sin? Uh, Genesis chapter 3, Connor mentioned, is where Adam and Eve are... are um, well, Eve is approached by the serpent. And the serpent deceives Eve into eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Lord, in one of his first commandments, not his first commandment, but the second commandment to them was, whatever tree you eat, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We might say, why would you not want your first offspring, your first creations, uh, or your first kind of uh, uh, sentient uh, um, body, bodied creations, to not have knowledge. Adam and Eve were created physically mature, but they were, they were spiritually, emotionally, mentally children. They had just been created. Imagine all the things that you would not want your two-year-old child to know. I can imagine off the top of my head at least 14 billion things that I don't want my two-year-old to know, that I protect her from. Um, and in a Semitic understanding, in the understanding of the Near East, the knowledge of a thing was the experience of a thing. Remember that after, it, you may not remember, but you, you may not have this kind of cultural consciousness that in Genesis, the biblical language, it says that Adam knew his wife, and they conceived and bore a son, right? Or this person knew their wife, and they conceived and bore a daughter, whatever. The knowing of the person is an experience, and that ultimate experiential knowledge of another person is in that sexual encounter, right? because you become one. So that's, that's this is a Semitic understanding of the knowledge of something being the experience. But there's no head knowledge in ancient Israel. I mean, there is, right? But that's not the kind of knowledge they're talking about in the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Now, why did, why did God put it there if they weren't supposed to eat from it? So St. John of Damascus tells us, it was no profit to man to obtain incorruption while still untried and unproved, lest he should fall into pride and under the judgment of the devil. What does that mean? This seems very dense. It was necessary for Adam and Eve to be tested, because they're children, so that they could grow in virtue, so that they could be established by making the virtuous choice of following God's commandments before being made incorruptible or unchangeable by e and, and godlike by eating of both the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice he doesn't prevent them from eating of the tree of life. He says, as you are now, you're not to eat from the, the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
There are several saints, fathers of the church, who express that uh, it is likely that if Adam and Eve had been established by the 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 um, going the other way, the original, I don't know, good deed or the original virtue of saying, no, we're not going to follow what the serpent says, we're going to follow God's commandment. By virtue of being tested, afterward they would have gained that virtue, that experience of holiness, experience of doing what God has laid out, not so much as laws of order, but laws of physics. And they would have then been able to mature and then have of the knowledge of tree, the, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. But as it was, they, they failed at this. They were given a test so that they could advance to what God had in store for them, which was union with him uh, and a mature union. And instead, they fell under the judgment of the devil. So this is also kind of a strange thing to say in, in that. Um, what does the devil's judgment have to do with anything? I mean, we... we, we have this kind of vague idea that the serpent was uh, the devil, but what does his judgment have to do with anything? To unpack what St. John is saying, it is that the devil envied humans. Envy was the reason for the fall. Envy was the reason why he tempted them. Because angels created beings, created before humans, were not created with this ability to grow infinitely. They were created in their station, in their rank, in their role. And this angel, some call Lucifer, you know, his role, um, so to speak, in the divine council was the prosecutor, Satan, um, the devil, after his fall. He was one of the highest angels, the seraphim, if I recall correctly. But he could see that the Lord created humans to be able, at least in potential, to go above the angels, and that caused envy and pride in them. And so he was, he was trying to basically uh, kill the dragon before it hatched. If we got them as little humans, immature, easily deceived, then they would never get to what their high calling was, which would be to be higher than the angels in union with God, not just God's brilliant, powerful, you know, servants, but also God's equals in a sense, which the angels never were and never can be. <clears throat> so that's the judgment of the devil, the krisi, the, the, uh, uh, is, is to, is to be like the devil was, not the devil's judgment, but the judgment that happened to the devil when he himself also took pride onto him, cast down, he dragged down humans with him. That's what it means that they were under the judgment of the devil. So, St. John of Damascus continues, man was snared by the assault of the arch fiend, the devil, and broke his creator's command. He was stripped with gr of grace and clothed with death clothed with death. So we. this is, if you have read some of St. Paul, he says, the wages of sin are death. This is why in today's homily, I was stressing that sin is a sickness. And it's not, it's, it's sometimes a good metaphor to think of as like a breaking a rule. It's not that it's, it's not that it's, you know, not that. Sometimes it's very clear the do's and don'ts, right? But it's more so that those rules, those laws, are laws of physics, laws of spiritual physics. And what happens when you break them is like, it's like when your doctor tells you, you got to eat servings of fruits and vegetables. You got to exercise. You know, you got to see other people. When you don't do that stuff, you, became, you become sick and depressed. That is a punishment in and of itself, right? But it's not really a punishment that's levied onto you. It's more like a reaction from not doing what we know human bodies are made to do in a healthy sense. So, um, <clears throat> I wanted to, uh, to read, um, let's see, a little excerpt 
from, uh, from a modern writer, in case you thought that I just spend my time in moldy old libraries and with the fathers of the third, fourth, fifth century, I do occasionally read blogs. And one of the ones that I have read in the past is Father Stephen Freeman's. And he says, I often struggle when people speak of their sins. Indeed, it is not unusual to be asked, is blank a sin? Who here has asked that question of a priest before? Pretty much everybody. Yeah. The question always makes me feel like a lawyer. It doesn't make me feel so much like a lawyer, but kind of, a little bit. Imagine that instead of a doctor, you have a lawyer whom you consult for your medical problems. You are having trouble breathing. You're short of breath, and occasionally you cough up blood. You go to your doctor, your lawyer, and he examines you. He doesn't listen to your chest, take x-rays, or do a scan. Instead, he asks you some careful questions. Have you ever smoked? No. Have you ever been exposed to asbestos? No. Have you always tried to take good care of your, care of your health, eaten correctly, and exercised? Yes. Well then, he concludes, I see no problem here. But I can barely breathe and sometimes I cough up blood. Well, clearly it's not your fault, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. But how's that bunion we discussed last time? Have you become truly sorry for buying those cheap shoes? You can see how some of, some of how we talk about sin in Western Christianity has taken on this character. But this is never how the Eastern Church understood what the consequences of Adam and Eve's fall. Instead, another good quote from, uh, we're back to the moldy old tomes, Saint Athanasius the Great, who wrote about the incarnation of Christ, he wrote about many things, but one of his most famous works is about the incarnation of Christ. Men having turned from the contemplation of God to evil of their own devising, had come inevitably under the law of death. And when I say law, again, this doesn't mean you know, simply that they broke a rule, excuse me, and God had another set of rules now to be placed on them that necessitated that they were now subject to death. It was a principle of existence that going away from God, going away from the beautiful, if you turn away from whatever's beautiful, what's left? Another trick question. Ugliness. Right. And so God, another one of the another another one of the titles, if you remember from the slide about the divine names, another one of the titles of God, the names, is the being. The being. We actually say this in every Orthodox service. We, uh, we, we, we miss it sometimes because we're not paying attention or we don't know what it actually means. But in Greek, it is on evlogitos Christos, on on evlogitos Christos of Simon. O on is a participle saying the one who is, the being. In Hebrew, the I am. Right? So, uh, and we say this because God is the I am, the one who exists, the being. And so to go away from him is to descend into non-being, willing. Death is just part of that. Very frightening and scary part of that, right? But a, the temporal death is a precursor to the eternal death that is non-being, that is being away, being away from being with a capital B. Elsewhere in that article, Saint uh, Father Stephen Freeman, Saint Stephen Freeman, Father Stephen Freeman says, the process of death and corruption is not a punishment, it's a consequence. This is exactly what we're talking about. It's a, it, the, the laws, commandments, all of these things that might seem oppressive to the modern eye are actually just principles of existence. They are laws of spiritual physics, not rules arbitrarily instituted to mess with us. So, we, we have now this problem that now Adam and Eve are separated from God. How do you make your way back? How do you make your way back? So um, a lot of this actually, not that, not that this was not uh, inspired and, and um, gotten from Father John in some way, but much of this uh, Father John uh, made a, a great deal of in his inquiry to Orthodox class, and I thought it was beautiful. 
that you know we're separated from God now, and kind of two minds started to emerge in the human race. <clears throat> the more kind of prevalent one, uh, geographically and by population, would say is the Greek mind. We're talking about Greek spiritually, right? Not necessarily ethnic Greek. And it's characterized by reason and logic, thinking and empiricism, polytheism, the mind as the highest principle, and the pursuit of excellence. We'll come back to Nikodia in a minute. And it's, it's, it's fundamentally anthropocentric. So remember we said God is a transcendent beauty. This mind is anthropocentric, centered on man. Okay, so um, we 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 come across a lot of this kind of reason and logic today, and it's fundamentally anthropocentric, meaning it cannot transcend past man. This type of mind is not and was not able to get into contact with the one true God, but its best philosophers recognized that there was one true God. They just didn't know who it was. When I say the pursuit of excellence, excellence is, um, excellence is a word uh, that is frequently used to translate the Greek word areti, which really means virtue. What is good? What is excellence? I mean, is Plato who asked that? Yeah. In the, in the dial, in dialogue with Mino. Yeah. And, and the answer is virtue, to be virtuous. But virtue in and of itself is not going to get you into contact with God. It might mean you're harmoniously, you know, uh, stewards of his creation, but it doesn't make you into contact with God. So most of the, of the, kind of what we call enlightened philosophers, the minds that developed throughout most of the rest of the world were like this. And we would say, without any sort of Greek ethnophilitism, that, that the Greek philosophers were the pinnacle of this. Uh, <clears throat> in contrast, the Hebrew mind was one of experience, poetry, imagery, symbolism, and it's because before they had a chance to start using that rational mind in that way, God revealed himself to them. In fact, God was always revealing himself to the Hebrews. Why the Hebrews? I don't know. Maybe because they had the best language for this sort of thing. Hebrew, unlike Greek, which is very, very good for precise, logical you know, things, and was taken on by the church to, to, to describe precise theological concepts, is Hebrew is very good at poetry. Not that Greek's not bad at poetry. Hebrew has this heart-centric way of being. But more than that, that's the Hebrew language. The Hebrew mind is experiential. It has the heart of the highest principle. And it's theocentric. If you read the Old Testament, some of you in here are in my Bible study. And we just We just finished... The, the, the histories, basically, right? So, Cali, if there's one thing you've learned about the Jews, what was it? They fall a lot. The history of the Old Testament is God revealing himself to the Jews, the Jews being like, yes, we will accept this covenant with you, even in in in, uh, in Numbers and again in Deuteronomy, uh, God specifically tells them, this is the way of life, this is the way of death. Right? All the commandments I gave you, this is the way of life. If you break them, that's the way of death. This is our covenant. And what happens, you know, Moses goes up to the mountain, Sinai, to receive the commandments. What do the people of Israel do? They immediately make an idol. Not immediately, I mean, he was gone for 40 days. But, I mean, that's pretty immediate. It's like the storm is still happening on the mountain. They can see. They can see that something's going on up there. Okay? So, as an aside, Moses, what was he doing up on the mountain? He was receiving, among other things, a vision of Genesis and of the heavenly temple. So, this kind of, to me, solves the, the question of, you know, young earth or old earth creationism. 
um, that it really does not matter from a spiritual perspective. Because Genesis is not a science textbook. Genesis is Moses writing down an ineffable spiritual vision that he received from the hands of God. So what does any of that stuff mean? It has meaning. It's mystical. We may not ever plumb the depth of the meaning of Genesis with our human minds, but if it leads us into the spiritual reality of what's in Genesis, then it's done its purpose. That God created out of nothing. That God created man and, man and woman. God created everything just by words, right? There's no, and it's, it's in direct contradistinction, this, this image, to other Near Eastern creation myths, but that's a topic for another time. So the Hebrew mind is theocentric. They're always, they are in contact with the living God, and yet they cannot, because, because of other kind of deficiencies, they don't have that kind of logical way about them. They're not going to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and uh, say, listen, God told us this, and it's very logical, and we, we think it's correct, and we agree, uh, we'll check all the checkboxes, and therefore this is exactly how we will behave all the time. In a certain sense, the Hebrews are more true to the human heart than anybody else, because what do we do until we establish a good habit? We, we fall, and we fall, and we fall, and we fall. Uh, and I have this point here, the henotheism versus monotheism. These are kind of modern distinctions. Um, uh, the Jews were never monotheists. God was trying to like show to them that he is the monotheos, monotheos, the only God, and the rest of the gods that everybody else around them worshipped were created beings, lesser than him. Divine beings, angels, fallen angels, but not on his level, not even close. He's a creator, they're created. It's like <clears throat> um, there's imagery in the Psalms and other wisdom literature of the pot telling the potter what's what. Like, it makes no sense whatsoever for a created being to challenge the creator. Um, they were drawn aside by the other peoples that worshipped and lived around them that seemed to have better relationships with their gods than they did. They were able to, you know, the Canaanites were able to sacrifice to Baal, Baal, and get rain in the minds and in the experience of the Hebrews, except for when they couldn't. Okay. Um, but that's, So that's the story of the Old Testament, the cyclical fall and like repentance, fall and repentance, fall and repentance. Nevertheless, you had this kind of pinnacle of the, the, the two minds. What they maxed out at, basically, was, number one, there is one true God, but we don't really know who it is. Our best, our best guess for what he wants us to do is to live virtuous lives. And two, we know the true God. He's given us his commandments. We can't live up to them. And so, instead of spiraling closer and closer and closer to God, instead of converging on God, we hit a wall, and at the same time, those who were not searching after God, the world was spiraling out of control. St. Athanasius writes that at the time of Christ's incarnation, there were adulteries everywhere, thefts, the whole earth was full of murders and plunderings. And as to corruption and wrong, no heed was paid to law, but all crimes were being practiced everywhere, both individually and jointly. Cities at war with cities, nations rising up against nations, and the whole earth was rent with civil commotions and battles, each man vying with his fellows in lawless deeds. Again, uh, for those of you in the, in the Young Adult Bible study, what's, what's been like the major backdrop of the entire history of Israel? Conquering or being conquered? War. Like, like the, 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 we just finished reading 3rd Maccabees. What was that about? That was about a series of, of wars. War, all the time. Violence, bloodshed, and adulteries, and, and all sorts of other things. And so that's where we were. 
And so it became clear, or at least it's clear to us, I'm sure it was always clear to God, that the solution was not going to be gotten to by us. So that's all for today. Next time, we're going to talk about the solution. Any discussion questions or um, things you've noted or points of clarification, now is the time. Yes. Tell me your name again. I'm sorry. Aaron. Okay. Aaron. God creating out of word as opposed to uh, as opposed to out of pre-existing matter. Right. So, um, and I'm not an expert philosopher, so correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, if there's pre-existing matter, what does that imply? God didn't create everything. God is not an all-powerful God. He just worked with what was already there. Now, um, I think more than anything else, I said that the Genesis story is in contradistinction to other creation myths. So in other creation myths, especially in the Near East, there is pre-existent matter, and the God who's creating it, creating, rearranges it or orders it in some way. So... I said that God revealed this to Moses, that he created out of nothing, so that he can make it clear that he's a cut above that. He's not, this is not like uh, your run-of-the-mill, you know, household God. We're talking about the God that created everything, including all matter. Um, the other thing that creation implies in the ancient Near East is imposing order on chaos. So that doesn't have anything to do with the distinction between created, like creating out of nothing versus creating from pre not matter, but it does uh, factor into the Genesis narrative heavily. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Callie. The creation produces the Trinity? Oh, introduces. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, so there's a great significance. I didn't choose my words randomly when I said he created by word. So when you say something, can you break down that process? Where does that, where does what you're going to say come from? Sorry, I just gave you a clue. Okay. And then what happens? You gotta, your mouth's got to form the words, right? But in order for the words to, to, for, to reach anyone's ear, what has to also happen? Air has to come out. So the fathers see an icon of the Trinity in this. God is the mind that is creating the, the, uh, what the word says, and the spirit carries the action. The, the, the mind, the word, and the breath. That's why spirit, pnevma, can also mean the wind. This is where sometimes in some, in some English translations of the scriptures, you hear this verse, the wind blows where it wills. The, this is, a, this is a kind of a pun on Jesus' behalf. Or, or, or that Jesus makes. He's saying the spirit of God blows where it wants to because it's like wind. It's like many other things too. But in that sense, right, this, is, this is not even an analogy, but just kind of like a, a way, one way of understanding how the Trinity created. It is not a, I want to stress that it is not a complete kind of like, oh, God is mind, the, uh, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, is Word, and the third person of the Trinity is the breath of air, right? So this is just one way of understanding it, a paradigm of understanding the Trinity, which is fundamentally not understandable, fundamentally transcendent, right? So even if we experience it, we're not going to understand it. Paul, you had a question? Right, right, right. It's a, it's a very similar thing in the Lord of the Rings, actually. It's, Paul says in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan was very obviously God. Like, if you read Chronicles of Narnia, you didn't get that Aslan was Jesus. Like, you probably were too young to get it. 
Um, uh, and he sings a song, right? So this is also true in Lord of the Rings with uh, the Eru. Eru sings a song, and the, and the ones that help him are the angels. The uh, so so there's a lot of literature that kind of recapitulates this act of creation that is that is by not just fiat but by trinitarian cooperation trinitarian synergy the fathers say that the trinity the only things that distinguish the trinity are that the father is is unbegotten the son is begotten and the holy spirit proceeds and saint gregory the theologian says if you want me to explain the difference between proceeds and is begotten, let's go uh, try to spoon the ocean out, right? Use a spoon to empty the ocean, and you and I will both go insane together. So it's not possible to understand, but we have these images that kind of bring us close to an experience. Experience. Paul. Are you are you asking a question about that? Or are you, say say it again. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So this is getting uh, into uh, some some more theology that we'll be discussing after, like probably around halfway through our nine sessions here. Um, but the question is, you know, is it that the Semitic mind? was kind of at play during what are called the monophysite controversies of the 5th and 6th centuries. Monop meaning, did Christ have one nature, monophysis, or two natures? The nature is a philosophical concept describing, you know, let's say I have a human nature, right? I have a, uh, a telos, an end. Remember that the end of human nature is God. And I also have certain, a, a will, which is the path towards that, and the energy that is my application of my power to get on that path or to do something else. Okay? So the big raging question after you know bigger things of Christ's identity were solidified, everything was revealed right in the person of Christ. But of course, for the person of Christ is also a mystery. So what, what's been revealed is also a mystery. And so what was what we consider dogma in the church is not a development of our understanding, but rather a clarification of the boundaries of what was already given to us. So the question at that time was, did, did Christ have two natures, a divine and human, or one nature, which is up in the air exactly what that is. But because the Semitic mind was so focused on monothe, like God is one, that was a, the, the famous meditative prayer that uh, the Jews would have, the, the, the Shem uh, in Deuteronomy, God is one, no Israel, that God is one. There was a kind of residual resistance to the idea of God having two natures. What does that mean? So, well, if that's all like word salad to you, don't worry, we'll build up to it. And also, doubly don't worry, because... We're not defined by our understanding of theology. St. Gregory the Theologian says it's actually dangerous for, for most people to theologize. And uh, when we get to theology, I'll reiterate this. Um, not a saint, but we definitely agree with him on this point. Evagrius of Ponticus says, whoever prays truly is a theologian. And if you're a theologian, you pray truly. So that's our criterion for a theologian in the Orthodox Church. No MDivs, no Master of Divinity, no PhDs from Harvard. If you, if you have been, it, real prayer is real communion with God. If you have that, if at the time that I am like with you, I also have a tangible, real experience of the Holy Spirit guiding my actions, then I'm a theologian. I, I apologize to you, I am not a theologian. <laughs> Just a priest. I have a duty and a blessing and a grace to teach, but I'm not a theologian. Theologian, very rare. In all the saints, 
that we have in the Orthodox Church, only three of them have the title theologian. St. John the theologian, St. Gregory the theologian, and St. Simeon the new theologian. And actually, St. Simeon the new theologian, people called him that derogatorily, as if he was preaching something new theology. And then it actually stuck, because it turns out he did have an abiding, deep experience of the presence of God, which was guiding his actions, which was, you know, dictating his actions. Even. Unless there are any last pressing questions, digest it. No? We'll digest it. For those of you coming to Wednesday Catechism, we'll see you there. Come with your questions. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll adjourn for today. Thank you very much for your attention. No clapping necessary, please.